Okay, here we go. We'd like to welcome you to our series on ethical issues and issues relating to um, malpractice in podiatry. My name is uh, Alan Jacobs. With me is Dr. Jeffrey Shook. And this session is being brought to you with the cooperative effort of Kent State University College of Podiatric Medicine and Surgery and the Podiatry Corporation of America. This is a uh, lecture series that we're hopeful will bring some uh, educational thought uh, to students, uh, residents, fellows, and uh, attendings in practice. So our discussion for this session is that of a very common problem, and that's dealing with the non-compliant patient, something that all of you are going to deal with. And um, I think this comic from Andy Cap summarizes it best, where you've given the advice, and at least he's being honest about it and saying, well, I'm not going to cooperate. What's your next best choice? And we want to talk a little bit about helping your patients stick to their therapy, because these are very, very common problems. And they are common problems. Some years ago, a, a well-known professional athlete in St. Louis, <clears throat> whom I had taken care of previously, uh, came to see me and um, had a Jones fracture. And um, uh, in a very uh, highly competitive sport, and it was a type 2 Jones fracture. I had recommended surgery with grafting. And um, he didn't want to do that. Instead, he wanted to have a brace put on that had been used on a, another professional athlete in St. Louis that he knew. Well, I didn't trust this individual. I didn't think he had a full appreciation of the dangers of a Jones fracture. He had had successful surgery by me previously. And against my better judgment, I agreed to brace him with an understanding that uh, this could end his career. He needed to be on crutches. He needed to be totally non-weight bearing. We needed to monitor this. That very evening, my wife and I were at Union Station in St. Louis, which is a, a local tourist area, and we were in the food court. My wife said, look over there. Isn't that so-and-so? And there he was, brace off no crutches, walking around with a beer in each hand. And I tell you this story because it is really what goes on with patients. Patients very frequently are not compliant. And you need to understand this and deal with this in an appropriate manner. So how do we describe non-compliance? And as you can see this definition, it's the degree to which a patient's behavior is not congruent with your recommendations as a podiatric physician. It is a common cause of treatment failure, whether it's post-operative, whether it is uh, a medication you prescribed, whether it is the use of uh, dressings or other home therapies such as physical therapy. And the biggest problem is it's widely unrecognized. And this can range from minor issues to catastrophic failure. For example, it is not uncommon for patients not to take medications which you prescribe or not take those medications properly. In treating fractures, in treating patients who have diabetic foot problems, as you know, offloading is frequently required and many times patients fail to offload. You watch them walk into your office, you watch them walk across the parking lot and you go, I, where's your crutches, where's your knee walker? Oh, I use that at home. I'm just wearing this shoe today and walking because I'm here for this appointment. Failure to interdict smoking. We know that smoking is associated with a variety of complications and poor outcomes. And frequently we advise patients to discontinue smoking and they continue to do so. Failure to control diabetes. We tell patients that in order to heal this wound, we need to maximize your diabetic control and they continue to uh, not adhere to their diet, to not adhere to taking their diabetic medications. DVT prophylaxis can be a very important issue. It can result in pulmonary embolism and death without a compliance. So we have a variety of non-compliance issues that can result in serious complication rates. How common is non-compliance? 
If you look at clinical trials where patients are registered and all they have to do is take their medications, they're getting free medical care, free visits, free everything, and the only thing they have to do is take the medicine they're asked to take. And you can see the compliance ranges from a low of 43% to a high of 78% a significant number of readmissions to hospitals are due to medication non-compliance. Look, for example, at serious issues like diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia. Only 59% of patients take medications that they're supposed to take greater than 80% of the time. And these are serious issues. And uh, by the way, when we talk about compliance, from a literature standpoint, compliance is generally regarded as 80%. That's generally the number that we cite. So that you're lucky if you get a patient eight out of 10 times to do what they're supposed to do. 90% of elderly patients make some medication error, and Lord knows as podiatrists, we treat a lot of elderly patients. 35% of the elderly make potentially serious medication errors, and only 75% of patients who understand you and agree with taking the medication are actually compliant. There are certain groups that tend to be particularly non-adherent, and oftentimes the, um, uh, we see the words or the term non-adherence utilized rather than non-compliant. Number one particularly applies to podiatry, and that's preventive care. As a podiatrist, one of our charges is to prevent or at least try to lower the risk of amputation in our diabetic patients. And we talk to them about management to prevent progression of their neuropathy. We talk to them about skin care. We talk to them about uh, offloading of calluses and preulcerative lesions, wearing proper shoes, and yet when we get into the area of preventive care, this is actually one of the highest areas of non-adherence. The longer the duration of therapy, the greater the risk of non-adherence. And here again, it may be something like treating a fracture, it may be treating, for example, a Charcot joint, and prolonged non-weight bearing is required. It may be a treatment of an ulcer, uh, with a chronic therapy required. And here again, uh, you've got to be aware as a student or resident or fellow that with preventive care, with long durations of therapy, you've got to be watching that patient and asking about compliance. Noncompliance or non-adherence is greatest for regimens that require behavioral changes, where we ask patients to modify certain things they're doing, such as weight loss, for example. Missed appointments are common, and once you get into practice, you will see this quite a bit. And it's more common when the patient goes to that front desk and you make the appointment for the patient, as opposed to patients calling in and saying, I want to make an appointment. So missed appointments, very, very common. One particular area is the neuropathic patient, and that's because asymptomatic patients are more likely to miss appointments because they don't perceive something that does not hurt as being a threat. And then lastly, we need to look at these patients and say, do they understand the problem? Because a lack of comprehension can be associated with as high a rate as 70% of noncompliance. Sometimes patients fail to understand instructions, and that is why we sometimes have to enlist family members or caretakers where uh, written instructions are sometimes helpful, printed materials, because non-comprehension is an issue. Some patients are just willfully non-compliant, and some studies have shown that up to 60% of all prescriptions, it may be an analgesic you've written, it may be an antibiotic, it could be an anti-inflammatory, it could be a muscle relaxant, but some studies have shown that 60% of the medications you write for are either taken incorrectly or not taken at all. And this is important because you're having this patient come back to see you and you're assessing response to treatment. And the question is, why is this patient not progressing well? Why are they not getting better? I thought I had the right diagnosis. I thought I had the right medication. 
think about noncompliance because it is there more commonly than you suspect. So again, this is particularly important in the asymptomatic patient. And I would say in podiatry, the biggest issue is the patient with sensory neuropathy, not with paresthesia and dysesthesia, but with numbness. Uh, because uh, these are the patients, as you know, get the ulcers and get the Charcot joints and get the horrible infections. And they tend to be non-compliant when there's no pain. Chronic problems, such as venous insufficiency, where we're prescribing compression therapy or intermittent lymphedema pumps or treating them for venous ulceration. Patients with cognitive impairment, patients who are demented, perhaps they just are incapable of appreciating the need for cooperation. And then complex regimens. We have the patients that, for example, we're treating for an ulceration. And we tell them, here's what I want you to do every day. You're going to wash this with this wound cleaner. OK. Then you're going to do this. OK. Then you're going to put this on. OK. Then you're going to use this particular dressing. OK. And by the time the patient hits your waiting room, if you're an elderly diabetic, studies have shown that on average, Patients only recall 50%, 50% of what you told them to do in the treatment room. And that's in the waiting room. So complex regimens are an issue. And this list is here because it's important for you to recognize the circumstances where noncompliance becomes an issue more commonly and to be attuned to this and to evaluate patients for noncompliance and to re-instruct them and also to document. What about medication noncompliance? That has probably been studied more than anything else. Some patients come back and they don't volunteer unless you ask them, but they never fill the prescription. There are many reasons they may not fill it, but the point is a surprising number of patients don't fill the prescription. It may be cost. It may be they're told that it's not um, a tier whatever on their insurance plan and so they assume they don't need it. Uh, perhaps there's a fear of getting a side effect. Uh, some patients just forget. And this is very, very common when you ask patients to have you been taking your pill and they'll say, well, usually, but sometimes I forget. Sometimes they take the right medications at the wrong time. Sometimes they just take the wrong medication. Some patients feel that if one pill's good, three pills must be better. And conversely, there are some patients who deliberately underdose because they get that printed material from the pharmacist or they talk to a friend or relative, and rather than consult with you, they make an individual decision, well, I'm just not going to take as much because I read here where this could happen or that could happen. But again, the cost of noncompliance is high. It is said that 40% of all readmissions to hospitals and elderly patients are due to Medicare or, or medication problems, and the cost is rather substantial. And if you don't think the cost of noncompliance is significant, look at these studies. Look at this one, for example, on cardiovascular related deaths due to noncompliance. Cardiovascular related deaths. It's greater than the number of people that die in auto accidents and AIDS in the United States every year. And if they're noncompliant with medications for their heart or their hypertension that can result in death, think about their perception of the need to take medications for a painful midfoot or Achilles tendinosis. So um, uh, these are, again, common examples, taking medications for sure. Preventive measures, as I've said, particularly in the diabetic patient, in the neuropathic patient, very, very difficult. Offloading. We tell the patients you need to offload for whatever uh, we're treating, and the question is, are they offloading? And you need to ask the patient and relatives and caretakers, did they stop smoking before surgery? I mean, typically we will recommend discontinuous, uh, discontinuance of tobacco products, you know, one or two weeks prior to surgery, and asking the patient, you know, did you do that? And more often than not, the answer is no. Keeping appointments, undertaking preventive measures, Following up with referrals, and this is one that's very, very important. Again, as a podiatrist, we will frequently make referrals to rheumatology, to vascular service, to, say, spine service uh, for concurrent pathology. And it's just not enough to tell the patient to do this. The question is, did they follow up? 
Then they get the laboratory studies that you ask them to go get. And you need to ask them and document whether they did or did not follow up. So here's some common examples in podiatry. Let's look at the Ponsetti casting technique for the treatment of clubfoot. Well, it's a very successful technique, as you probably know, with 90% uh, correction rate initially. And yet the most common cause of relapse is after all this concern by the parents and all the work casting and working with these children and worrying about their skin and worrying about positioning, uh, the failure of those parents to follow up with adequate bracing as we've asked them to do is the most common cause of relapse clubfoot following Ponsetti treatment. Look at chronic venous insufficiency. As podiatrists, we see a great deal of venous insufficiency. And as podiatrists, we, re we, we recognize that this can impact on quality of life. It can result in ulceration. And yet, when we prescribe compression stockings, Many patients don't use the stockings. Almost half the patients never purchase the stockings. Or they get an initial pair, and then they need a second pair, and they discontinue using it because of the cost. So this is common. Here's a common problem that we all see in podiatry, and that's Achilles tendinosis, insertional tendinosis. And here again, we know that stretching is a big part of treating Achilles tendinopathies, and yet, we see that most patients are simply non-compliant in carrying out those activities. They come back to our office and they go, well, I still hurt. It still bothers me going up and down stairs. And the question is, are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? Are you following the physical therapy program and the stretching protocols that we gave you? And the chances are they probably were not. So as a podiatric physician, you say to yourself, well, the good news is it's not my problem. But in fact, it is. So one thing that's often cited, whether it's a surgical procedure or medication, is the concept of contributory negligence. And we say, well, I'm off the hook as a doctor because this patient didn't listen to me, they didn't follow orders, so it doesn't really matter what I did, they're guilty of contributory negligence. And you have to understand that the concept of contributory negligence as such is not followed in many portions of the United States any longer. Now, the original concept was that if the patient were negligent in any way and contributed no matter what percentage to their own damage, that the doctor was essentially, quote, off the hook, and there was no negligence for the doctor. But in today's world, very few states or districts recognize that concept of if the patient didn't do what they were supposed to do, the rest doesn't matter. Most states follow the concept of comparative negligence, and that is to say it mitigates damages against you as the doctor in a malpractice action by penalizing the plaintiff only for their contribution to the damages. So there'll be a uh, finding of negligence by you against you if there was some negligence and from that award they will subtract a percentage based upon what the jury feels was the contribution to the poor outcome and bad result by the plaintiff and there's pure comparative negligence and there's modifications that can occur in a sense, pure would be the, the plaintiff was 40% responsible, the doctor was 60% responsible, so we'll take this award against the doctor and reduce it by 40%. And then some states have uh, different ways they define these things. For example, in some states, uh, the finding will be that uh, uh, we will only grant uh, if the uh, plaintiff's negligence was not as great as the defendant's negligence and others, it's got to be greater than 51%. So we see different states define comparative negligence in different manners, but my point to you is non-compliance, non-adherence does not excuse you from a negligence action. It just mitigates some of the damages. So was the patient non-compliant? And as an experienced old guy, sharing ex my experience in, in practice for 40 years and having been involved in some malpractice cases as an expert witness over the years, uh, I, I, I hope that this 
registers with you students and residents and fellows more than anything. Take the time to chart your instructions and the failure of the patient to follow those instructions. Because a patient will deny that they were directed to do things by you very frequently. I was never told that. And you're going to say, of course I did. And they're going to rely on your chart. And they're going to ask you, doctor, can you show us in the chart where you told Mrs. Smith to use crutches and stay off her foot for a month? Can you show us in your chart where it says they are to apply this dressing daily, but first wash their foot with whatever? Can you show us where you instructed the patient to monitor their foot for any evidence of infection? So number one, chart instructions, because electronic medical records have made people lazy. And people are not taking the time to put into these records what needs to be put into these records. Chart always the instructions you have given the patient. Ideally, you would provide the patient with written instructions. That is something that would be perfect with a copy in the chart. Operative notes. This is not mandatory. It is not standard of care, but I think it's smart. I always include the post-operative instructions in the body of my operative note. So I have a further record of what it is I instructed the patients to do. Pay attention to the discharge summary and records. Uh, all of us are in a hurry these days, and the discharge instructions are handed to a patient, and some attendings tend to just sign off on these things and don't read what's actually in those discharge instructions. So you may say, I told this patient not to apply ice because they were diabetic, or they had vascular disease, or a history of Raynaud's. And they would say, well, doctor, would you look at those discharge instructions where it says, apply ice 15 minutes every hour, or it says nothing. And you'll respond to me, well, those are standard discharge orders, uh, but that's what was given your patient. So make sure that when you're at the surgery center or the hospital, or you're dismissing a patient from an inpatient stay, that the discharge instructions, as well as the discharge summary, are clear as to what the instructions are for that particular patient. And then your follow-up notes are critical. It is very important to inquire as to whether or not that patient has been compliant. If not, you are to document their noncompliance, the effects of that noncompliance, and if you can assess it, why they were not noncompliant. Now, one question is, can the patient comply? Are they capable of being compliant with what you're asking them to do? And oftentimes, we hear about the four Ds. Denial, where the patient just does not want to accept the fact that there is a problem. Sometimes they are depressed and they're simply not capable of complying. Some people, for whatever reason, just don't want to get well. And they depend on visits to the doctor, uh, sympathy from family members. They, they literally want to be sick. And then lastly, dementia. Or is the patient capable of being compliant? Can they understand? Other considerations include things like financial concerns. We may want the patient to get a night splint for their plantar fasciitis or Achilles tendon problem. We may want them to utilize orthotics. We may want them to utilize a certain medication, but they can't afford it and become non-compliant or not adherent because of that. That does not mean, by the way, that you change your recommended therapy. Uh, if that is still your preferred therapy, that is what you have to uh, advocate. And if the patient cannot do it, then uh, adjustments may have to be made reluctantly, but it's because of non adherent Third-party coverage. Oftentimes, patients return and we say, did you have this done, this particular test? Did you get these dressings? They go, it wasn't covered by my plan. Living conditions. The older you get, the more tuned in you get to the fact that some people don't have the capability 
of doing what you want them to do, and the more you'll start asking about living conditions. For example, let us say you're doing a major reconstruction on a Charcot foot, and the patient's gonna have a big old external fixator and be in a wheelchair. Do they have the ability to use a wheelchair where they live? Do they have steps they have to go up and down? How will they get to the bathroom? How will they get to the kitchen? How will they clothe themselves? And then family support. Do they have support to enable them or assist them in being compliant with your request? Social support systems, family support systems, very, very important. Sometimes patients are non-compliant because it's inconsistent with how they visualize themselves as a male or a female. Social class does make a difference. And in previous experiences with relatives or friends who had the same problem, what's the use of treating this? My brother had diabetes and they ended up taking one toe at a time and then they took his leg off. So that's what's gonna to happen to me, okay? And, uh, and again, you have to look at that and sort it out and deal with it. They may have limited healthcare access. They may not have transportation to get to your office or to the particular clinic. Some will argue that they're just too busy to be compliant. They just have too, too much of a schedule. Language barriers. Language barriers are difficult because they're associated with uh, increased risk of medical error and medical mistakes, as well as noncompliance. But again, it's our job to look and see whether that is the issue and see if it is correctable in some manner, uh, all these things. Also, how we communicate what's wrong to the patient. Patients sometimes are non-compliant because they don't see the problem as being serious enough and they don't appreciate the consequences of non-compliance. Patients need to understand that that diabetic ulcer can lead to an infection and loss of leg. And you need to document that the patient was told that and that the patient expressed an understanding as opposed to it's just a hole in the bottom of my foot and it doesn't hurt, so how serious can this be? And for those of you who are students, maybe to a lesser extent, residents and fellows, as you go through life, you will hear this repeatedly. I didn't think it was important because it didn't hurt. You'll hear this over and over again. And it's your job to take that time to explain to the patient the seriousness of this problem. So how do we hit this target? What do we do? Um, well, number one, as I've mentioned, ask about compliance. Do not ever assume that your patients are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Do not assume they're offloading. Do not assume they're doing their home physical therapy. Do not assume they're taking their medication or taking it properly. Ask about compliance and document every visit, whether they've been compliant or not been compliant. If they have not been compliant, then document the effects of that noncompliance. How is it impacting on that patient's recovery? You then have an obligation to re-instruct the patient and document that they were told again what to do and the potential effects. If you continue smoking, there are gonna be increased risk for this thing healing slower. If you continue smoking, we're gonna have difficulty uh, healing this wound. If you don't take care of your diabetes, it's gonna slow down healing and raise your risk for some serious complication. It's unfortunate that you have to spend the time to do this, but this is the reality of the world we live in. So ask about compliance and document it. How do you assess compliance? And it's difficult. Most commonly we ask the patient because it's simple and practical, but asking a patient results in underestimation. Only between 40 and 80% of patients will admit non-compliance. So at best, one out of five patients is non-compliant and doesn't tell you that. At worst, over half patients are non-compliant and will not tell you that. Self-reported compliance by patients, if you take that at face value, overestimates how compliant they really are. Oh yeah, I've been doing what you told me to. Well, let's talk about that a minute. 
And the manner in which you ask makes a difference. You want to ask this in a non-threatening manner, and you want to let the patient know that you are there to assist them. You're not there to chastise them. You're not there to belittle them. Uh, you're not there to punish them. So the manner in which you ask and respond to their noncompliance is going to make a difference with honesty. But if, you, for example, you perceive that something is not healing as rapidly as it should, and you express concern, and you let the patient know that you are concerned, that we need to figure out what's going on here, sometimes that's helpful in getting the patient to go, well, to tell you the truth, I've been eating ice cream and cherry pie every night after I take my insulin. Or to tell you the truth, maybe I haven't been off of this foot as much as you had told me to. Or maybe to tell you the truth, I'm still smoking a pack and a half a day. So the manner in which you approach the patient is critical. There are all sorts of gimmicks we can use. We read all the time about devices, for example, that we could place in a diabetic shoe or a cast and monitoring these patients electronically. But these things are expensive. Insurance carriers almost always fail to pay for these things and they're simply not practical. So we're, we're basically down most often to questioning the patient. If you're having a problem with a non-compliant patient, step back and ask yourself some things. Do they really understand their problem? Perhaps you thought you had communicated to them effectively. Perhaps you thought they understood it and they didn't. And do they really understand the purpose of the treatment? When I put patients on home physical therapy programs, sometimes this seems simplistic to them, to say, here's the gastroc soleus stretching I want you to do and the plantar fascia stretching I want you to do. And you're thinking, one of the patients upset that they're paying this copay and deductible for me to tell them to stretch this or that. So I need them to understand why it is I'm telling them to do this, what the purpose is, okay? And do they understand, again, the potential consequences of not being compliant. They need to understand that. If you're having a difficult time and you're getting this kind of look from the patient, then try to enlist others. And particularly in podiatry, it's common for people to show up at the office with a friend or a relative. So try to enlist them to support you, to support the patient, to try to get them to be uh, more compliant. Uh, so there are sometimes people that you can enlist. I personally try to establish a relationship with the patient. I want them to know that I'm there to help them and that we are working on this together. And I'm not being judgmental. I'm not being critical, but these are the things that we, not you, we have to do to get this better and try to establish a sense of trust and confidence and not make the patient feel like they're just a number, another number, they're being run in, they're seeing me for 10 seconds, my back is to them while I'm working on the electronic medical record, and they have a sense that I really don't care. I want that patient to know that I care and that we are in this together, but I also need them to do their part, that this is a joint venture, that we're in this together. And you can do this, but it does take some time and it does take some effort. But I think that is what you want. Listen to the patient. Make eye contact with the patient. Watch them and listen to them and watch for nonverbal clues. Um, I sit down, I try to look relaxed. I want the patient to know that I do care. I don't engage in maneuvers that tend to distance me from the patient. I don't get too close and invade their space. And I try to think of all these things as you will too. But the most important thing is to listen to them and watch them for nonverbal clues. It's been said sometimes that in our interactions, the most important things are the things that aren't said rather than what was said. And if we look at forms of communication, there's no question Handing the patient written documents or using electronic communications gives you something substantial. But I also, again, can't emphasize enough nonverbal communications because it tells you ultimately what the patient's really thinking. And it's been said that over half, if not the majority, of all communication in reality is nonverbal. 
So we watch the patient. We watch their response to what we're saying. We watch their response to instructions. And it gives us help in saying what it is that we, we need to reemphasize. Your communications need to be complete. We need to communicate all relevant information. We need to make it clear to them so they understand it. We try not to take two hours to do this. And we do it in a timely manner so that we have to think, how are we most effective? Those of you who have ever been a patient, and probably as a student or resident or fellow, you're too young to have ever been sick. But once you're on the other side of it, you realize more and more what patients want. And that is they want to be heard, they want to be seen, and they want to be accepted as a person, not a number and not a diagnosis. And again, if you could emphasize, emphasize with that patient, I think you'll find that they will be more cooperative because they understand that you are concerned about them. Talk about one thing at a time, try to use simple language but direct and detailed information and again if there's any kind of printed material that is always going to be helpful don't approach them with a threatening authoritarian approach again you use phrases like this osteotomy is not healing as quickly as we would like what what do you think we should be doing here i thought you are doing this right and we need to think about what else we could be doing to speed this along. But be non-judgmental, be non-threatening, and as much as possible, try to make this shared decision-making so the patient feels you're not speaking down to them. Overall, be nice. Provide reassurance, be caring, provide good information, and make sure that you keep your promises. If you say that you're going to do certain things, do certain things. It's been said that people remember best what was said last. So some of the things I do is inquire such as, oh, when you get home, how will you be using that knee walker? Did you ever get that furniture moved around? Uh, how, oh, by the way, how are you dealing with those steps to get to the bathroom? You, are you still able to keep your weight off that foot? And then one of the things I do is act stupid, which as I get older is easier and easier for me to do. And Instead of saying to the patient, I want you to repeat everything I said, I said, I want to make sure I didn't forget anything. What did we go over so far? So I want to make sure I didn't forget something. And get the patient and their family or caretakers involved. And I find that's kind of a useful trick that's, that's kind of helpful at getting them back. A couple other things. Making referrals to specific doctors rather than clinics. As a podiatrist, again, you'll see many patients who have, for example, previously undiagnosed vascular disease. And you're going to say to them, I need to refer you to a vascular surgeon or interventional radiology or interventional cardiology. I don't leave it to the patient to do that. I ask them if there's a specific referral that they would like to have. Otherwise, we refer them to a specific doctor. And we have the office make the appointment for them while they're there to assist them. What it really does is ensuring that they followed up with that doctor. And we try to reduce the waiting time if possible so that if necessary, we pick up the phone and speak to the doctor and say, listen, this is a particular case I'm concerned about. Is there any chance we could move this appointment up to this week or next week? And yes, it takes a little bit of time, but it's part of your showing your caring and concern. We never have patients get block appointments at the office. We don't book by 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. We give them individual appointments and try to minimize uh, time between scheduling and make sure that, make sure that you follow up on um, whether or not they did go for that referral. Now, what about the non-compliant patient? Is this the way we should treat them? Is this the way that uh, we should treat them? Probably not. Things that don't work. You can't throw your hands up and just ignore the problem. You can't just dump them on some other doctor and just export the patient. You can't stand there and accuse the patient of being a problem. You can't pretend that there's not a problem and say don't worry about it when there is. Because all of this results in anger and counter-blaming and a 
poor doctor-patient relationship. So try to follow the things that we talked about before. And try to be a good doctor in general, because if patients' expectations go unsolicited, go ignored or disrespected, they become frustrated, they become less interested in what you are saying, they tend to become more non-adherent or uh, non-compliant, they start looking at alternatives and they start showing up at your office and saying, uh, instead of that medicine you wanted me to take, I'm taking this extract of uh, Eye of Newt and, uh, and Head of Leeches because uh, my friend said this is work. And you get more and more poor outcome. So you've got to maintain that doctor-patient relationship. Now, non-adherence and non-compliance is different from a difficult patient. Difficult patients are a different entity, and that's anyone who seems to interfere with your ability to establish a therapeutic um, relationship, and it's difficult. It's been estimated that one out of every six patients, when doctors are questioned, are felt to be difficult, and it leads to burnout, and it leads to a less satisfactory day for you. So difficult patients are just that, but it's not the same as a non-compliant patient. Be careful in discharging patients. Different institutions, different insurance carriers, different states have various requirements for discharging a patient. But don't ever just say, don't come back to this office. You've got to offer varying amounts of continuing care, availability, and make that transition to seeing another physician uh, easy for the patient. What you don't want to be accused of is abandoning the patient. As miserable as they may have been, as non-compliant as they may be, as angry and upset with that patient as you may be, you simply cannot discharge that patient without assuring a safe transfer. So make sure that you're familiar with the policies in your particular state, with your particular insurance carriers, with your third party carriers, and so forth and so on. On the other hand, non-compliance can be summed up this way in many ways, and uh, uh, this is certainly true. Uh, it's not uh, the right way to be about things, but it can happen. And of course, we have the fact that ignorance can be educated, crazy can be medicated, but as a famous comedian says, there's just no cure for stupid. So in summary, when it comes to the issue of non-compliance, this is much more common than as a student resident or fellow you might suspect. Make sure you're charting instructions. Try to give written instructions whenever practical. Include your uh, discharge requirements in the body of your operative note, in your discharge summary. Make sure you are very familiar with discharge instructions that are being given so that what you want the patient to do is on those discharge instructions and conversely, those instructions don't have uh, directions that are contrary to what you think would be in the best uh, interest of the patient and make sure you are assessing compliance in your follow-up notes in the office. 